This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Return of the Native by Thomas Hardy Book 3. The Fascination 6. Yobright goes, and the breach is complete. All that evening, smart sounds denoting an active packing up came from Yobright's room to the ears of his mother downstairs. Next morning he departed from the house and again proceeded across the heath. A long day's march was before him, his object being to secure a dwelling to which he might take Eustacia when she became his wife. Such a house, small, secluded, and with its windows boarded up, he had casually observed a month earlier, about two miles beyond the village of East Egdon, and six miles distant altogether, and thither he directed his steps to-day. The weather was far different from that of the evening before. The yellow and vapoury sunset which had wrapped up Eustacia from his parting gaze had presaged change. It was one of those not infrequent days of an English June which are as wet and boisterous as November. The cold clouds hastened on in a body, as if painted on a moving slide. Vapours from other continents arrived upon the wind, which curled and parted round him as he walked on. At length Klim reached the margin of a fir and beech plantation that had been enclosed from Heathland in the year of his birth. Here the trees, laden heavily with their new and humid leaves, were now suffering more damage than during the highest winds of winter, when the boughs are specially disencumbered to do battle with the storm. The wet young beeches were undergoing amputations, bruises, cripplings, and harsh lacerations from which the wasting sap would bleed for many a day to come, and which would leave scars visible till the day of their burning. Each stem was wrenched at the root where it moved like bone in its socket, and at every onset of the gale convulsive sounds came from the branches, as if pain were felt. In a neighbouring brake a finch was trying to sing, but the wind blew under his feathers till they stood on end, twisted round his little tail, and made him give up his song. Yet a few yards to Yobright's left, on the open heath, how ineffectively gnashed the storm! Those gusts which tore the trees merely waved the firs and heather in a light caress. Egdon was made for such times as these. Yobright reached the empty house about midday. It was almost as lonely as that of Eustacia's grandfather, but the fact that it stood near a heath was disguised by a belt of firs which almost enclosed the premises. He journeyed on about a mile farther to the village in which the owner lived, and, returning with him to the house, arrangements were completed, and the man undertook that one room at least should be ready for occupation the next day. Klim's intention was to live there alone, until Eustacia should join him on their wedding day. Then he turned to pursue his way homeward, through the drizzle that had so greatly transformed the scene. The ferns, among which he had lain in comfort yesterday, were dripping moisture from every frond, wetting his legs through as he brushed past, and the fur of the rabbits leaping before him was clotted into dark locks by the same watery surrounding. He reached home damp and weary enough after his ten-mile walk. It had hardly been a propitious beginning, but he had chosen his course, and would show no swerving. The evening and the following morning were spent in concluding arrangements for his departure. To stay at home a minute longer than necessary after having once come to his determination would be, he felt, only to give new pain to his mother by some word, look, or deed. He had hired a conveyance, and sent off his goods by two o'clock that day. 
The next step was to get some furniture, which, after serving for temporary use in the cottage, would be available for the house at Budmouth, when increased by goods of a better description. A mart, exten extensive enough for the purpose, existed at Anglebury, some miles beyond the spot chosen for his residence, and there he resolved to pass the coming night. It now only remained to wish his mother good-bye. She was sitting by the window, as usual, when he came downstairs. Mother, I am going to leave you, he said, holding out his hand. I thought you were by your packing, replied Mrs. Yobright in a voice from which every particle of emotion was painfully excluded. And you will part friends with me. Certainly, Clem. I'm going to be married on the 25th. <clears throat> I thought you were going to be married. And then, and then you must come and see us. You will understand me better after that. And our situation will not be so wretched as it is now. I don't think it likely I shall come to see you. Then it will not be my fault or Eustatia's, mother. Goodbye. He kissed her cheek and departed in great misery, which was several hours in lessening itself to a controllable level. The position had been such that nothing more could be said without, in the first place, breaking down a barrier, and that was not to be done. No sooner had Yobright gone from his mother's house than her face changed its rigid aspect for one of blank despair. After a while she wept, and her tears brought some relief. During the rest of the day she did nothing but walk up and down the garden path in a state bordering on stupefaction. Night came, and with it but little rest. The next day with an instinct to do something which should reduce prostration to mournfulness, she went to her son's room and with her own hands arranged it in order for an imaginary time when he should return again. She gave some attention to her flowers, but it was perfunctorily bestowed, for they no longer charmed her. It was a great relief when, early in the afternoon, Thomasin paid her an unexpected visit. This was not the first meeting between the relatives since Thomasin's marriage, and past blunders having been in a rough way rectified, they could always greet each other with pleasure and ease. The oblique band of sunlight which followed her through the door became the young wife well. It illuminated her as her presence illuminated the heath. In her movements, in her gaze, she reminded the beholder of the feathered creatures who lived around her home. All similes and allegories concerning her began and ended with birds. There was as much variety in her motions as in their flight. When she was musing, she was a kestrel, which hangs in the air by an invisible motion of its wings. When she was in a high wind, her light body was blown against trees and banks like a heron's. When she was frightened, she darted noiselessly like a kingfisher. When she was serene, she skimmed like a swallow, and that is how she was moving now. "'You are looking very blithe upon my word, Tamsie,' said Mrs. Yobright with a sad smile. "'How is Damon?' He's very well. Is he kind to you, Thompson? And Mrs. Yobright observed her narrowly. Mm, pretty fairly. Is that honestly said? Oh, yes, Aunt. I would tell you if he were unkind. She added, blushing and with hesitation, He... I... I don't know if I ought to complain to you about this, but uh, I'm not quite sure what to do. I want some money, you know, aunt, some to buy little things for myself, and he doesn't give me any. I don't like to ask him, and yet 
perhaps he doesn't give it to me because he doesn't know. Ought I to mention it to him, aunt? Oh, of course you ought. Have you never said a word on the matter? Mm, you see, I had some of my own, said Thomasin, evasively. And I've not wanted any of his until lately. I did just say something about it last week. But he seems... he seems not to remember. He must be made to remember. You are aware that I have a little box full of spade guineas, which your uncle put into my hands to divide between yourself and Clem whenever I chose. Perhaps the time has come when it should be done. They can be turned into sovereigns at any moment. Hmm, I think I should like to have my share. That is, if you don't mind. You shall, if necessary. But it's only proper that you should first tell your husband distinctly that you are without any, and see what he will do. Very well, I, w I will. Uh, aunt, I've heard about Clem. I know you're in trouble about him, and that's why I've come. Mrs. Yobright turned away, and her features worked in her attempt to conceal her feelings. Then she ceased to make any attempt, and said, weeping, Oh, Thomasin, do you think he hates me? How can he bear to grieve me so, when I've lived only for him through all these years? Hate you? No, no, said Thomasin soothingly. It is only that he loves her too well. Look at it quietly, do. It is not so very bad of him. Do you know, I thought it not the worst match he could have made. Miss Vye's family is a good one on her mother's side, and her father was a romantic wanderer, a sort of Greek Ulysses. Oh, it's no use, Thomasin, it's no use. Your intention is good. But I will not trouble you to argue. I've gone through the whole that can be said on either side, times and many times. Clem and I have not parted in anger. We have parted in a worse way. It is not a passionate quarrel that would have broken my heart. It is the steady opposition and persistence in going wrong that he has shown. Oh, Thomasin, he was so good as a little boy, so tender and kind. He was, I know. I did not think one whom I called mine would grow up to treat me like this. He spoke to me as if I opposed him to injure him, as though I could wish him ill. There are worse women in the world than Eustatia Vi. <laughs> there are too many better. That's the agony of it. It was she, Thomasin, and she only, who led your husband to act as he did. I would swear it. No, said Thomasin eagerly. It was before he knew me that he thought of her. And it was nothing but a mere flirtation. <laughs> Very well. We will let it be so. There's little use in unravelling that now. Sons must be blind if they will. Why is it that a woman can see from a distance what a man cannot see close? Clem must do as he will. He is nothing more to me. And this is maternity, to give one's best years and best love to ensure the fate of being despised. Oh, you are too unyielding. Think how many mothers there are whose sons have brought them to public shame by real crimes before you feel so deeply a case like this. Thomasin, don't lecture me. I can't have it. It's the excess above what we expect that makes the force of the blow, and that may not be greater in their case than in mine. They may have foreseen the worst. I am wrongly made, Thomasin, she added, with a mournful smile. Some widows can guard against the wounds their children give them by turning their hearts to another husband and beginning life again. But I always was a poor, weak, one-idead creature. I had not the compass of heart nor the enterprise for that. Just as forlorn and stupefied as I was when my husband's spirit flew away, I have sat ever since, 
never attempting to mend matters at all. I was comparatively a young woman then, and I might have had another family by this time, and have been comforted by them for the failure of this one son. It's more noble in you that you did not. <laughs> the more noble, the less wise. Oh, forget it and be soothed, dear aunt. And I shall not leave you alone for long. I shall come and see you every day. And for one week Thomasin literally fulfilled her word. She endeavoured to make light of the wedding, and brought news of the preparations, and that she was invited to be present. The next week she was rather unwell, and did not appear. Nothing had as yet been done about the guineas, for Thomasin feared to address her husband again on the subject, and Mrs. Yobright had insisted upon this. One day, just before this time, Wild Eve was standing at the door of the quiet woman. In addition to the upward path through the heath to Rainbarrow and Mistover, there was a road which branched from the highway a short distance below the inn, and ascended to Mistover by a circuitous and easy incline. This was the only route on that side for vehicles to the captain's retreat. A light cart from the nearest turn descended the road, and the lad who was driving pulled up in front of the inn for something to drink. "'You come from Mistover?' said Wild Eve. "'Yes, they're taking in good things up there. Going to be a wedding.' And the driver buried his face in his mug. Wild Eve had not received an inkling of the fact before, and a sudden expression of pain overspread his face. He turned for a moment into the passage to hide it. Then he came back again. "'Do you mean Miss Vi?' he said. "'How is it that she can be married so soon? Ho, oh, oh, by the will of God, and a ready young man, I suppose.' "'You don't mean Mr. Yobright?' "'Yes. He's been creeping about with her all the spring.' I suppose she was immensely taken with him. Ho, <laughs> ho, she's crazy about him, so their general servant of all work tells me. And that lad Charlie looks after the horse. He's all in a daze about it. The stun poles got fond like of her. Is she lively? Is she, is she glad? Going to be married so soon, well... Oh, turn so very soon. No, not so very soon. Wild Eve went indoors to the empty room, a curious heartache within him. He rested his elbow upon the mantelpiece, and his face upon his hand. When Thomasin entered the room, he did not tell her of what he had heard. The old longing for Eustacia had reappeared in his soul, and it was mainly because he had discovered that it was another man's intention to possess her. To be yearning for the difficult, to be weary of that offered, to care for the remote, to dislike the near, it was Wild Eve's nature always. This is the true mark of the man of sentiment. Though Wild Eve's fevered feeling had not been elaborated to real poetical compass, it was of the standard sort. He might have been called the Russo of Egdon. End of chapter 6